Before there was Ellen Ripley. Before there was Wonder Woman. There was the original action heroine, Atalanta. Now available in ebook, paperback, and audio form. Links in the description. The Ventru, The Blue Bloods, by far the most arrogant, insufferable, up their own ass canites it is possible to encounter in the modern nights. They just love to remind you of how special and superior and wise they are. How they are just the most precious and specialist of blood-sucking parasites that have ever been and ever will be. Hence, they are claimed to be the rightful rulers of kindred society. After all, what would the lowly rabble do without them and their guiding hands? They are the most capable and therefore the most worthy. The only ones that truly deserve to lead not just the Camarilla, but vampiric society as a whole. But perhaps the most aggravating, insufferable thing about Clan Ventru is that they're right. Not all the time, but certainly they are right a lot more often than anyone would like to admit. But whence comes this arrogance and this sense of superiority? Well, to hear the Ventru tell it, it begins with Cain and the First City. Granted, the Ventru aren't exactly the most reliable of narrators, no one truly is in the world of darkness, but there literally is nothing better, so this is what we have to start with. Like with most of the Antediluvians, the progenitor of Clan Ventru's name and identity has long been forgotten, and he is generally referred to in the sources as Ventru. According to the clan, Ventru was not simply embraced by one of the second generation, in this case Enoch, according to the sources, but that Enoch performed the embrace on the instructions of Cain himself. Of course, there are alternate versions, like one that suggests that Ventru was a nobleman from another land, whom Enoch embraced without any instruction from Cain. Some sources even insist that Ventru's sire was not Enoch, but Irad, general of the first city. Those Ventru who do believe in the Antediluvians, and there are very few of these because the Camarilla officially denies their existence, insist that their namesake founder was the very first of the Antediluvians. As if that didn't make him oh so special enough, Cain took Ventru under his wing, the story goes, and soon made his grandchilder his closest advisor and confidant. Naturally, of course, the other antediluvians were very jealous of Ventru and the special place he had at Cain's side. Interestingly, the one that hated Ventru the most in those early days was not the progenitor of Clan Bruja, as one might expect given relations between the clans in the modern knights, but rather the founder of Clan La Sombra. Which is kind of fitting, given that, as one of the leaders of the Sabbat, Clan La Sombra had for many centuries served as the dark mirror image of the Ventru. Pun very much intended. But of course, no one challenged Ventru's preeminence among the third generation openly, because Cain backed him, and no one in those days dared go against the Dark Father. Of course, eventually the Great Flood came, and the first city was destroyed. According to the Ventru, Cain himself came to their progenitor and placed upon him the mantle of leadership, the Dark Father having decided to go wander off into the wilderness. Frankly, I'm quite skeptical of this, as it seems to assume that Cain not only expected the other antediluvians to accept Ventru's leadership, but also the second generation, who were individually more powerful than the antediluvians, including Ventru's own sire. Of course, the flood eventually subsided, and those vampires that survived tried rebuilding the civilization that had been lost. The way the Ventru tell it, the second generation decided to defy Cain's instructions to accept Ventru's leadership and essentially take over for themselves. But since none of the Antediluvians really liked their sires, they decided to rebel against them and made Ventru one of their principal leaders. The second generation was overcome and diablerized, and the Antediluvians then set about building the second city. There are some Ventru, particularly among the Ventru anti-tribu, we'll get to them later, 
who insists that their progenitor was the only antediluvian that refrained from taking part in the diablerie of the second generation. It was at this point that Cain returned and was righteously pissed off at the killing of his childer by his grandchilder, and so inflicted upon the antediluvians the distinctive curses of their clans. A line from the Erceus fragments, supposedly uttered by Cain himself, declares, Behold my proudest child, whose own pride betrayed him. Let the blood of the humble sicken him and give him no sustenance. Thus, the Ventru clan curse that they can only drink from the blood of very specific types of people. Naturally, those Ventru who still believe in the antediluvians, such as the aforementioned Antitribu, insist that this is not, in fact, a curse, but a mark of distinction, and that their rarefied taste is a mark of their superiority. Yes, the Ventru really are that arrogant. After Cain finished cursing his grandchilder and then disappeared back into the wilderness, abandoning the undead to their fate, Ventru and his small cadre of progeny tried holding the second city together. But the other clans and their antediluvian founders were too powerful and too restless. No one in the second city, it seems, desired peace. Ventru tried cracking down on this rebellious sentiment, to the point of even exiling Set, progenitor of the followers of Set, but this only served to inflame the other's resentment of him. In desperation, Ventru tried to leave the second city in search of Cain, hoping to convince the Dark Father to return and restore order. That proved to be a mistake. Ventru left one of his childer in charge, but he did not hold power for very long. The La Sombra antediluvian seized power, but his reign too was short, as the third generation and their nascent clans fell to war among themselves. Ventru himself was never seen or heard from again. Many Ventru insist that their progenitor was murdered, either by one of Clan Bruja or even the Bruja antediluvian himself, or herself. Either way, the second city was doomed and the undead, including Ventru's childer, scattered across the world, mostly the Mediterranean. Like most vampires in those early days, the spawn of Ventru tried setting themselves up as god kings in various human localities. Naturally, being Ventru, they saw their open rule of the kind as a way of bringing law, order, and civilization to the unwashed masses of the mortals, and that it was, for lack of any better term, their divine right to rule over humanity. Although applying the word divine to a race of beings whose progenitor was literally cursed by God is more than a little oxymoronic. In the Book of Nod, there are phrases attributed to the Ventru Antediluvian where he ostensibly commands his childer to bring civilization and order to the world. Given that Ventru ostensibly disappeared before the Diaspora, and the fact that in this speech he invokes deities of religions that didn't exist yet, given that the Second City is still part of prehistory, the Smart Money says this part was added to the Book of Nod after the fact by Ventru elders. Quote, We ruled in Enoch. We ruled in the second city. Dumazid, Gilgamesh, Zeus, Jupiter. We are every great man, every perfect man. We rule not by strength, but by right. Be the lawgiver, the toolmaker. Carry the sacred meh to the people. Keep the covenant. Bind those that rebel glory in those who fight and win. Keep strong swords about you always, and sharp eyes at your back. Cower not in fear of the sun, shrink not from fire. Though cursed we may be, we are the lords of the earth, and all things fall under our dominion. Met is a Sumerian concept that combines both divine decrees and concepts and arts of civilization. According to the Sumerian poem Enki and the World Order, examples of meh include the concept of kingship, trades like smithing, leatherworking, and weaving, laws, arts, weapons, peace, wisdom, fear, even sex is apparently a meh. Naturally, there's no exact or even reliable count of how many childer Ventru sired before his disappearance, or even who they all were. The fact that some of these Methuselahs may or may not have been diablerized over the course of millennia only serves to further muddy the waters. This highly speculative list includes figures like Mithras, Lord of the Baronies of Albion, 
Alexander, who was Prince of Paris during the Dark Ages, and Antoninus, one of the founders of the Dream in Constantinople. There are also the figures of Tinia and Vedarta, the former of which was worshipped by the Etruscans, and the latter who settled in India. More on them later. There was Arakur, god-king of the Sumerian city of Ur, who was mostly known for his great rivalry with the supposed gangrel Methuselah, Urlan of Uruk, his penchant for claiming mortals that matched his type of blood as his brides only to feed on them at his leisure, and for embracing a young witch named Lantla, who was eventually possessed by a demon, went on a murder spree, and was known ever after as Tiamat, named for the Mesopotamian goddess of chaos. Another such Ventru god-king was Madan, who ruled over an island in the Aegean until the kind of that place revolted, burnt down his palace, and then dragged him out into the sun to taste final death. News of his destruction horrified the other Ventru, who henceforth decided that it might be better to rule humans from the shadows. One such Methuselah, a woman who was said to have been the very first embraced by the Antediluvian, eventually wandered into the hills of the Peloponnese in Greece, where, one night, she waylaid a mortal, hoping to feed upon him and then just leave his drained carcass in the bushes. Luckily for this particular mortal, he was a fast talker, and his words actually piqued the vampire's interest. The name of this mortal was Lycurgus of Sparta, and his beliefs and ideas would inspire this vampire, who later called herself Artemis Orthea, to lay the foundations of what the Ventru clan would ultimately become. For someone growing up in a modern Western country, founded on a combination of Christian moral principle and Enlightenment philosophy, classical Sparta comes off looking like the most insane society ever conceived of by the mind of man. A rigid three-tiered caste system ruled over by warrior elites who engaged in such delightful cultural practices as primitive eugenics, pedophilia, and launching regular training raids onto their own slave population in order to terrorize them into giving up any thought of resistance. And if the semi-mythical Lycurgus was indeed a real person and the man behind Sparta becoming what it was, then it is arguably the oldest known example of a planned society. That is, a society created in accordance to an ideology as opposed to one that evolved naturally over cumulative time and experience. At any rate, the world of darkness certainly assumes that he was real, and that his ideas were very appealing to the Ventru Methuselah, who eventually called herself Artemis Orthea. The memory of her kin Medon's destruction at the hands of the mortals he had ruled openly remained fresh in Artemis's mind, and so she became one of the first Ventru to decide that it was better to work with mortals and rule through them rather than simply tyrannize over them. And so, assuming the identity of one of Sparta's patron goddesses, hence her assumed name, Artemis Orthea obtained great influence over the Spartans. However, she also recognized that her authority had limits, and that she dare not run roughshod over her new mortal following lest she suffer the fate of Medon. As Lycurgus imposed his reforms and his infamous constitution upon Sparta, Artemis discovered that there were indeed many admirable qualities, or at least qualities that she thought admirable, about Lycurgus's system. Qualities that her clan would do well to emulate. When Sparta overran the neighboring region of Messina and enslaved its entire population, turning them into the famous Helots, Artemis saw obvious parallels between them and the vampires. The Spartans needed this massive population of slave workers so that they could dedicate their lives to training for war. In the same way, vampires were dependent upon the masses of the kind, albeit to fulfill different needs. The influence of Sparta on Clan Ventru carries over into the modern knights, particularly in how the clan is organized and led both on a global level and on a local level. In terms of global leadership, the supreme authority within Clan Ventru is the so-called Directorate, which is comprised of the twelve most powerful and influential elders of the clan. But the term Directorate is a relatively modern designation. 
In the old days, they were called the Ephorate, in reference to the Spartan Ephors, five powerful magistrates who had a leading role in determining Spartan policy and even had some authority over the city-state's dual monarchy. In the modern knights, the Directorate is responsible for electing who represents Clan Ventru on the Camarilla's inner circle, managing global policy for the clan as a whole, and sometimes arbitrate over disputes within the clan provided they are significant enough. They are also responsible for meeting out punishment to anyone who betrays Clan Ventru. Below the Ephorate are another Greek-inspired rank, the Strategoi. Named for the Greek word that simply means military governor or war leader, the Strategoi are in charge of enforcing the will of the Directorate in the same way that Justicars enforce the will of the Camarilla's inner circle. In order to ensure that their loyalty is to the Directorate and nothing else, Strategoi are specifically forbidden from holding any other office outside of the clan. Then there's how Sparta influenced local leadership within Clan Ventru. At the bottom rung of any Ventru population within a domain are the Eiren, known as associates in the modern knights. The Eiren are essentially the newly embraced, Ventru who have just been inducted into the clan as full members but have yet to really prove themselves. By contrast, at the very top of local Ventru leadership are the Garusia, named after Sparta's Council of Elders, a combination Supreme Court and Senate comprised of the two kings and 28 men who had to be 60 years or older in order to qualify. Known as the Board in modern knights, a Ventru Garusia is exactly what it sounds like, a council of the local Ventru elders. They arbitrate internal disputes, they also are in charge of overseeing clan business and policy within the city. One can only join the Garusia by direct invitation and with the approval of a majority of the existing members. Above all, the Garusia's most important job is to ensure harmony within their local Ventru community. The Ventru have always understood that the less they fight among themselves, the stronger and more influential they become as a whole, compared to other clans. Perhaps the most important legacy of Sparta is the Ventru training program for new arrivals, which they call the Agoge, after the Spartan military academies. The difference is that where the Spartan Agoge used a combination of brutal training, harsh discipline, and buggery to turn little boys into the deadliest warriors Greece would ever know, the Ventru Agoge is meant to train newly embraced neonates into useful assets to the clan. After a newly embraced Ventru child has been given a few days to acclimate to their new existence, the sire begins a lengthy process that can take weeks or even months, training the neonate not only in the use of his or her powers, but also giving them intense lectures on the history of the clan and its traditions. Ventru sires are not gentle with slow learners. Ventru Childer are regularly quizzed on what knowledge they are supposed to have obtained by then and are often punished harshly for giving wrong answers. The Agoge continues even after a child has been formally presented to the city's prince and thus officially inducted into kindred society. The Ventru have very high standards for who they induct into the clan and they wish to be thorough in their assessment. It is only after the neonate has completed a series of tests, including being able to establish themselves in the city on their own without assistance from the wider clan, that the local Garusia will even consider finally acknowledging them as full members of Clan Ventru. One of the reasons that the Ventru consider themselves above other Canites is the fact that they do hold themselves, generally speaking, to higher standards than the others. And it all began with Artemis Orthea and her admiration for the equally uncompromising standards of the Spartans. Hers became an example that other Ventru chose to emulate. And so these Ventru in turn established themselves in various Greek city-states, mostly in the Peloponnese, and manipulated the local governments into allying themselves with Sparta in what became known as the Peloponnesian League. The most prominent of these being Avarchus, the Ventru master of Corinth. Essentially the second city of the League after Sparta itself, Corinth, by controlling the Isthmus of Corinth, effectively dominated trade between the Peloponnese and mainland Greece. Avarchus was one of the very first Ventru to understand the value of trade and the power of money. 
and he was more than happy to take advantage of both as a way of making himself the richest vampire in Greece. Thus, while Artemis Orthea was, in terms of ideology and principles, the founding mother of Clan Ventru as they are in the modern knights, Evarchus became the very first example of what would become the stereotypical Ventru template, the Ventru as undead plutocrat. But the good times did not last, and the problem began with the Greco-Persian Wars. Initially, Artemis did not want to get involved in the war, but the Spartans decided they were going to fight anyway, an excellent example of just how limited Artemis's authority over them was. Sparta, of course, played a key role in besting the Persians, such as winning the decisive land victory at Plataea, but the war also saw the rise of another power in Greece, the city-state of Athens a city-state that was not part of the Peloponnesian League, contributed the lion's share of ships to the allied Greek fleet, crushed the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, and, perhaps most importantly of all, were backed by Clan Bruja. After besting the Persians, Athens grew in both power and wealth, eventually establishing its own alliance with the islands of the Aegean and the coastal cities of what is now Turkey, thus forming the Delian League and threatening the Ventru-backed Peloponnesian League's dominance in Greece. Evarchus was especially angered at this because Athens' maritime dominance meant that it now became the wealthiest city in Greece at the expense of his Corinth. Inevitably, this mutual hostility ignited a war, what the mortals called the Peloponnesian War and what the Ventru called the First Bruja War. The fighting was long and hard, but in the end, the Spartans won. First, by developing a navy of their own, and then, under the command of the general Lysander, catching most of the Athenian navy by surprise at the Battle of Aegos Potami. The Athenian navy was all but eradicated, the city itself was left defenseless, and Athens surrendered. By the time the Ventru and Spartans took the city, however, most of the Bruja had escaped. Still, it was a victory, and Lysander was rewarded for his contribution by being embraced by Artemis Orthea herself. Sparta's victory, however, proved short-lived. Within a few decades of winning the Peloponnesian Wars, Sparta would be decisively defeated at the Battle of Leuctra by a league commanded by the city-state of Thebes, a city-state that unusually did not have any vampires backing it at all. Leuctra was devastating for Sparta, not only because the Thebans managed to kill a large number of Spartan warriors, always few in number and taking years to train, but they then liberated Messina, and thus the vast majority of the Helots, depriving Sparta of the slave labor needed to maintain Lycurgus's system. In typical fashion, the Spartans were stubborn and refused to change their ways. By this point, Artemis, Orthea, and Lysander could see that the end was nigh, and abandoned the Peloponnese for the Greek colonies established in southern Italy, known as Magna Graecia. Evarchus stubbornly held out in Corinth, but eventually he slipped into torpor. And while he has resumed activity in the modern nights, by this point millennia have passed, and his power is but a shadow of what it once was. For now, we follow Artemis and Lysander to southern Italy, where the next foundational chapter in the story of Clan Ventru would soon begin. Winding back the clock several centuries to the Diaspora, there was Tinia, a Ventru Methuselah supposedly embraced by the Antediluvian himself. The story goes that she journeyed to Italy, and with 13 other vampires came to rule over the Etruscans, an Italic people that inhabited the region that roughly corresponds to modern Tuscany. Like most vampires at the time, Tinia and her compatriots ruled over them as gods. In fact, Tinia herself shares a name with the Etruscan sky god, although whether she lent her name to this deity or adopted it like Artemis Orthea did in Sparta is unknown. Not much is known about her except that she had a thirst for discovery and knowledge, eventually got so old in vampiric terms that she became spiritually and creatively burnt out, losing the ability to innovate, and that she was overthrown by one of her childer, a fellow by the name of Kolat. Kolat was young and ambitious, and unlike his sire and her fellows who favored the Etruscans, he had a special fondness for a small city in the south called Rome. 
Some credit Colot as the inspiration behind Rome's decision to rebel and ultimately overthrow its Etruscan overlords. Other sources say that he merely took advantage of it. Either way, he became top undead dog in the Eternal City and effectively became the Prince of Rome, though it is debatable whether that position really existed back then. His tenure oversaw the transition of Rome from small city-state to burgeoning empire, and from its earlier kingdom to a republic. However, Collot is important mostly because his style of rule was different than that of any Ventru before him. He was one of, if not the very first of his clan, to adopt the policy of indirect rule of humanity from the shadows. His sire, Tinia, and even Artemis Orthea over in Sparta, had ruled their respective humans openly as god-kings in the Old Mold, although in the case of Artemis, it was done with a very light touch in order to avoid provoking a rebellion among the kind. She had influenced Spartan decision-making, but had never really commanded obedience. And, as the Greco-Persian Wars demonstrated, the Spartans could ignore her advice and decide what to do for themselves. It was Colot that in many ways anticipated the way that the Camarilla would seek to rule humanity in the modern nights. Colot's great skill was in collecting favors and peddling influence. Roman families built their power on a series of patron-client relationships, a kind of quid pro quo. The Roman elite were clients to the plebeians, Colot was client to the Roman elites. And so, via this tangled network of favors and clientelism, Colot effectively puppeteered the Roman Senate, and thus the Republic as a whole, nurturing it through its period of expansion. It was during this time that many Greek ventru, such as Artemis Orthea and her child Lysander, emigrated from Greece to southern Italy, a region called Magna Graecia because it had been long settled by Greek colonists. Artemis made Syracuse in Sicily her new home before eventually falling into torpor, while Lysander set up shop in Tarentum, modern-day Taranto, in the arch of the Italian boot. Inevitably, the two civilizations came into violent conflict, and though both sides had vampires working with them, the Romans were just better at fighting. And so, in desperation, the Magna Grecians reached out to the old homeland for help. Pyrrhus, king of Epirus, answered the call, mostly because it gave him a great excuse to go conquering. He did win several battlefield victories against the Romans, but the casualties of those victories were so high that his name would become immortalized in the phrase Pyrrhic victory. In the end, Rome triumphed, and Magna Graecia submitted to Roman rule. It was in one of the final battles of the conflict known as the Pyrrhic War that Lysander, who had been fighting alongside the Tarentines, was made prisoner by one of Colot's childer, a curious and ambitious young Ventru named Titus Venturus Camillus. Camilla for short. Evidently, Camilla was a big believer in being civil to prisoners of war, for he treated his captive with courtesy and often engaged in conversation with him. And so, from Lysander, Camilla learned a great deal about the world beyond the tiny, tiny Italian peninsula. Lysander told him of what the Greeks had achieved and what Clan Ventru had achieved, how Artemis Orthea had reigned over Sparta and, by extension, the Peloponnesian League. Camilla, who had only ever known his sire's way of doing things, was shocked and intrigued by the idea of Artemis Orthea ruling openly as a goddess over Sparta. And so, the more he talked with Lysander, the more the germ of an idea began to grow in his mind. When the Pyrrhic War concluded, Camilla returned to Rome with Lysander at his side. He confronted Colot and told him that he had a new vision for how the Roman Ventru should rule. Supposedly, Colot saw the wisdom of Camilla's vision and willingly stepped down from power. More likely, Camilla overpowered and diabolized his sire with Lysander's help. For the most part, Camilla's style of rule as Prince of Rome resembled that of his sire. He would not command the Romans or let his vampiric nature be known to them, the Romans being a very superstitious and hostile people. Also, like Colot, his power was built on collecting favors and establishing patronage for several prominent patrician families. The main difference was that Camilla would work far more directly with the Roman elite to guide and influence their policies. 
mostly by using ghouls as proxies and messengers. The Roman Senate had never really been aware of Kalat's existence as he'd manipulated them during his tenure. Now, many of them knew that there was some ultimate power broker in the shadows of Roman society. But, to his credit, Camilla also understood that the best way to lead people was to let them think that your idea was really theirs. For example, Camilla would point out to his clients how important it was to ensure that trade flowed smoothly or that the legions could go from one province to another as quickly as possible. And so the Romans figured, let's build and maintain some roads. Camilla would point out how useful it would be if Rome had more reliable sources of clean drinking water. And so the senators would commission aqueducts. Camilla's example is one that many Ventru sires in the modern knights try to impress upon the younger members of the clan. A truly effective Ventru does not hoard power, though the other clans might foolishly think otherwise. He knows how to delegate, how to share power, judiciously, carefully, but share it nonetheless. Be the big idea man, let your proxies sweat the details. Of course, when the Romans carried out these plans, Rome benefited. They received glory and kudos for their achievement, and of course, made sure to repay the favors owed to their mysterious shadowy benefactor. And so Camilla grew rich and powerful, but he remained a vampire with very narrow horizons. As long as prosperity improved in Italy, he really didn't have any interest in what lay beyond. If the Romans wanted to conquer new lands, he wasn't going to stop them, but nor was he going to directly encourage them either. Granted, the Romans never really needed any encouragement to expand their territory. By contrast, Lysander was very concerned with what lay beyond the borders of Italy. He would often secretly travel the Mediterranean, acting as Camilla's eyes and ears. And it wasn't long before he discovered Carthage and its Bruja masters. Ever since his embrace by Artemis Orthia, Lysander had possessed a deep hatred for the Bruja, who had backed Athens, the enemy of his original homeland of Sparta. The Bruja had slipped through the Ventru clan's fingers after the Peloponnesian War. This time, Lysander was determined that this rival of his clan be humbled properly. He didn't really need much of an excuse to begin calling for Carthage's destruction, though the horror stories attributed to its vampiric rulers certainly gave him more justification. But Camilla remained singularly uninterested in the matter. And then, in 265, Carthage decided to muscle in on a dispute between two Greek cities in Sicily, Syracuse and Messina, which I got mixed up with Messenia in the previous chapter. Syracuse, if you recall, was Artemis Orthea's new home, though by this point she had slipped into torpor. The new vampiric ruler of the city was a Malkavian named Alcius. When an envoy of the Bruja told him that Carthage had plans for Sicily and that he'd better not stand in their way, the Malkavian, mentally unstable like most of his clan, flew into a rage and decapitated the envoy on the spot. Realizing that he had just put himself into some serious hot water, Alcius revived the sleeping Artemis Orthea and another prominent vampire in Syracuse, Arakel, the purported antediluvian founder of Clan Toreador. Between the three of them, they managed to influence the leaders of Syracuse into preparing for war with Carthage, while at the same time finally managing to persuade Camilla to enter the war on their side. So commenced the three Punic Wars, at least that's what the mortals called it, to the Ventru, it was only three phases of a single conflict, the Second Bruja War. In the First Punic War, there was a lot of fighting between both the mortals and the undead, but the war was mostly ended by the humans, with Rome coming out on top and claiming overlordship over the former Carthaginian possessions of Sicily and Sardinia. After Carthage's capitulation, Lysander was all for going in and dealing the killing blow to the Bruja. But thanks to the failures of several Roman and Ventru incursions into Africa during the war, Camilla remained reluctant to involve himself in anything beyond the shores of Italy. When Hannibal Barca kicked off the Second Punic War and invaded Italy via the Alps, there was actually little to no vampiric involvement. 
Those aligned with the Romans were stunned into fearful silence by Hannibal's audacity and his many crushing victories in the field, while the Bruja were happy to sit back and let the Carthaginian general do the fighting for them. Once again, though, Rome won. Once again, Carthage capitulated, and once again, Lysander, this time backed by Alcius and Artemis Orthia, insisted that Camilla should take the fight to the enemy. And again, Camilla refused. But this time, Lysander was not about to be denied, and he continued to pester Camilla on the idea of finally destroying Carthage and the Bruja that infested it. On the mortal side of things, this was around the same time that the famous statesman Cato the Elder began ending each of his speeches with the famous phrase, Carthago de lenda est, Carthage must be destroyed. It's never mentioned as such, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if Cato the Elder was perhaps a ghoul of Lysander's. And so at last, the many voices clamoring for action wore down Camilla's resistance, and he gave his consent to instigating a war with Carthage. For the Romans, the Third Punic War was little more than a formality, a quick siege and a lengthy sacking of the city. For the vampires, it was one of the most savage fights in all of antiquity. Dozens tasted final death that night. Among those were Tiberius Carnifex, a powerful and prominent child of Camilla, and Artemis Orthia herself, the founding mother of the clan. Alcius, the Malkavian prince whose actions helped precipitate the Bruja War, was badly injured and slipped into torpor soon afterward. Lysander lived, though with many new scars. By his order was Carthage raised to the ground and the very earth salted to ensure that nothing would grow and that any Cainites that had escaped the Ventru wrath by going into torpor beneath the earth would never arise. From then on, it was nothing but uninterrupted success for Rome, conquest piled upon conquest. Spain, North Africa, Greece, Anatolia, the Levant, and Clan Ventru, headed by Camilla, grew fat and prosperous indeed. However, all that conquering meant that now the Roman Empire included a lot of vampires that were not Ventru. And so, in a way, Camilla and the Roman Ventru found themselves in a similar position to that of the Ventru Antediluvian and his childer in the Second City ruling over an unruly and motley collection of vampires of all shapes and sizes. It was then that Camilla did the most important thing for the legacy of Clan Ventru in its entire history. Up until this point, like every other vampire from every other clan, each Ventru had essentially ruled his or her patch of territory, a law unto himself or herself. It was Camilla who insisted for the first time that if the clan wished to hold on to its position of preeminence among the undead, they needed to organize. Power and authority needed to be centralized. As the Roman Republic failed and transitioned into the Empire, Camilla took his cues from several prominent mortals of the time. Marius, Sulla, Pompey, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and most important of all, the man who one day became Augustus, first emperor of Rome. Obviously, unlike Augustus, Camilla could not attain the kind of absolute power that the mortal ruler did, but that was not really his plan. What he did do was establish a system by which more powerful and senior members of Clan Ventru were given autonomy in local affairs in the provinces, mostly adjudicating disputes between younger and more junior members. Naturally, Camilla assumed the position of top dog within the entire clan, the supreme arbiter of disputes across the empire, but like with the mortals of Rome, he knew to reign with a light hand. Vampires, and especially Ventru vampires, are after all a bit more powerful and dangerous than mortal senators. It doesn't do to push too far with them. Regardless, it was by establishing this hierarchy across the empire that Camilla essentially made Clan Ventru what it was. And well into the modern nights, although obviously younger members of the clan chafe against it, most Ventru concede that it is this organization that is the reason why the clan is as successful as it is, and why they are so determined to maintain it. If we return to the global structure of Clan Ventru in the modern nights, below the Ephorate and the Strategoi that are the legacy of Sparta, from Rome come the positions of lictors and tribunes. 
If the Ephorate is the Ventru equivalent of the Camarilla's inner circle, and the Stratagoi the equivalent of Justicar's, Lictors are essentially the equivalent of Archons. Named after the bodyguards that protected high-ranking Romans, Lictors are known as troubleshooters in the modern knights. And, much like the Archons do for Camarilla Justicars, Lictors serve as the direct agents of individual Stratagos within Clan Ventru. After all, no vampire, no matter how powerful, can be everywhere at once. By delegating more minor tasks to Lictors, the Stratagos is able to focus on bigger issues within the clan. If the Everett and Stratagoi serve as the brains of the clan's global leadership, and the Lictors are the muscle, the Tribunes are the eyes and ears. Sometimes called agents at large in the modern nights, their job is essentially to keep an eye on things and, if necessary, report difficult matters to higher authorities. They also serve as a direct line of communication between the Ephorate and local Ventru leadership. Speaking of local leadership, between the Spartan-inspired ranks of the Gerusia and the Eiren lie three Roman-inspired ranks, Praetors, Aediles, and Questors. Alternately known as managers, supervisors, and foremen, respectively, the higher up the ranks you are, the broader your responsibilities. Praetors, for example, mostly comprise the local Gerusia and deal with broad issues concerning the local Ventru community. The Aediles concern themselves with specific areas of interest to the clan, while the Questors handle disputes and issues concerning individual clan members. But apart from the fact that you have to be an elder to be a Praetor, how exactly does one rise the ranks within Clan Ventru, locally or globally? Which brings us to perhaps the most important legacy of Rome upon the clan, the concept of Dignitas. Dignitas is difficult to summarize. It's an intangible thing that can't be quantified. It encompasses not just a Ventru's dignity, but also the sum of his accomplishments his status in society, and the measure of what the Ventru, anyway, consider to be honor. It is the sum of a Ventru's worth as an individual. Dignitas can be increased by winning conflicts, making alliances, and by holding offices within the clan. But it can also be lost through failure, through insult, and defeat. To a Ventru, Dignitas is the second most precious thing in their whole undead existence. The most precious obviously being the blood they need to survive, and even then some Ventru would likely debate you on that. It is by increasing one's Dignitas that a Ventru climbs the ranks, both within local communities and within the overall leadership of the clan. And if you make the mistake of impugning a Ventru's Dignitas or diminishing it in any way, rightly or wrongly, deliberately or by accident, then you have made an enemy for eternity. Ventru have waged feuds lasting centuries all because of a perceived slight. That is the supreme importance of Dignitas. It's no wonder, therefore, that Rome is really where the Ventru truly came into their own, and why so many elders look back on it as a golden age. But of course, like all golden ages, it was never destined to last. The fall of Rome is something lamented by many Ventru elders, both in the immediate aftermath and in the modern nights. And while most will concede that the clan has not achieved the same degree of power and influence over all vampiric kind ever since, Many who disagree point out that the Empire didn't so much fall as it transitioned into something else. After all, the Eastern Empire carried on for a thousand years after the fall of the West, and even as the West fell to the barbarian invasions, Clan Ventru was able to easily adapt to the new circumstances, especially as those barbarians settled down in the new lands they'd conquered and eventually evolved into the kingdoms and principalities of the Middle Ages. For the Ventru, it wasn't that much different than puppeteering imperial governors. It was just that the nature of the pawn had changed, but the kind remained pawns all the same. Camilla, the architect of Ventru greatness under the Romans, fell into torpor in the mid-first century. Because he seemingly disappeared during the Great Fire of 64, it was believed that he had tasted final death. 
Instead, he reawakened in 1229 when an earthquake killed the then Prince of Rome, allowing him to retake his old seat. Disgusted with this newfangled Christianity thing, he formed his court around a dark, twisted mirror image of the papal court, which is quite impressive if you know anything about the history of the papacy, and eventually fell back into torpor only to reawaken in the modern nights. Meanwhile, Lysander, his faithful right hand, quietly moved to Constantinople and seems to have not gotten involved in any way in the vampiric politics of that city. He effectively disappeared in the aftermath of the 1204 sacking of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade and has not been seen or heard from since, although purported sightings and rumors of his activities have persisted into the modern nights. As Europe transitioned into the Dark Ages, Clan Ventru began to split into two directions. Those who clung to the waning power and glory of the Roman Empire moved east to Constantinople. Those who remained in the West, out of stubbornness or opportunism, sought control over the nobility and emerging kings of the new European polities, while others sought to infiltrate that last remaining remnant of Rome in the West, the Catholic Church. Like a lot of vampires in Europe, many Ventru retained their Christian faith even after the embrace, while a small minority in the Middle East embraced Islam. However, those lands were dominated by the Banu Hakim, and so the tiny Muslim Ventru minority, the El Hijazi, remained small and for the most part inconsequential. But while many were happy to embrace priests, courtiers, guild masters, and merchant princes, the twin warrior legacies of Sparta and Rome weighed heavy on the minds of most. And so many Ventru made their names in the Dark Ages as knights and warlords. In many ways, the Dark Ages represented a kind of freedom for the Ventru, especially those who had chafed under the regulations and hierarchies imposed on them by Camilla during the height of Rome. During this time, there were many vampires, even Ventru vampires, who ruled openly over the Kine, something that Camilla had never permitted. While you could find a Ventru vampire from one end of Europe to another, the Ventru were most predominant in Northwest and Central Europe, namely Britain, France, and the Holy Roman Empire. Hardestat the Elder reigned over the fiefs of the Black Cross, one of the great vampiric courts of the Dark Ages, while Britain and parts of France fell under the sway of Mithras. Formerly a Persian soldier who had migrated to Britain, gone into torpor during the Roman Empire, and awakened in 1066 during the Norman Conquest. Through a combination of raw power, incredible charisma, and a willingness to negotiate and compromise, he established the Baronies of Albion, granting greater autonomy to his subordinates than in other courts in exchange for pledges of loyalty to him and to defend his great seat of London. But that's not to say that the Ventru held no sway in the East. They had some influence in Hungary. At least one Ventru, Lucius Trebius Rufus, was the Prince of Jerusalem in the 13th century, and another, called Antonius, was the Prince of Cairo. And then, of course, there was that other, far more famous Antonius, a Ventru Methuselah of remarkable power and one of the three co-founders of the Dream in Constantinople. He's mostly known for, one, embracing the famous Byzantine general Flavius Belisarius into undeath, instigating the iconoclast movement in the 8th century, and being such a hard-ass on maintaining the masquerade that eventually his co-founders, the Draken and Michael, decided that he needed to die. Although given that Draken soon left Constantinople in despair and Michael descended into madness afterwards, that might have been a bad move. While we're on the subject of the Byzantines, another interesting embrace into the clan was none other than Anna Komnena, daughter of Emperor Alexios Komnenos, the man who essentially instigated the Crusades as a way of getting his territory back from the Turks. She would go on to plot to overthrow her own brother, Emperor John II, in favor of her husband, survive the Fourth Crusade's sacking of Constantinople, and has reigned into the modern knights as the Prince of Nicaea. Given their fondness for embracing among the nobility, and their oh-so-high opinion of themselves, the Ventru were especially fond of the French, and there is no greater evidence of this than the Ventru's adoption of the concept of noblesse oblige, a tradition that persists in the modern knights. 
In the Dark Ages, the Thirteen Clans were roughly divided into two groupings, the so-called High Clans and the Low Clans. This was a distinction made not on the basis of power and influence, but more on the fears and prejudices that many vampires shared towards one another at the time. Naturally, the Ventru were counted among the High Clans. The Ventru have always believed that it is their right to rule over the wayward scions of Cain. But for them, it is not rule merely for its own sake. They believe that it is their right to rule for the betterment of all Cainites. With great power comes great responsibility. And this is the root of noblesse oblige as the Ventru see it. A Ventru must earn dignitas in order to acquire status and power within the clan and Cainite society as a whole. Having gained such status and power, however, he or she now has certain obligations to their fellow clanmates and to their fellow vampires. If a vampire, regardless of clan, approaches a Ventru for protection or some boon, Noblesse Oblige demands that the Ventru fulfill this request. What's more, Noblesse Oblige demands that Ventru offer their assistance to their fellow Cainites. Any vampire that spurns such an offer from a Ventru may find that previously generous door closed against them should they change their mind. The Ventru do not forgive, and obligation is a two-way street. The Ventru believe that it is their duty to rule well. In return, they believe it is the duty of the other clans to acknowledge their authority and give them proper respect. Like all clans during the medieval period, the Ventru were embroiled in the Jihad, the never-ending struggle for power among vampires. They contended against the Bruja in Spain, the La Sombra in Italy, and the Tsimitsi in the East. They also contended with one another, most infamously during the Crusades, which pitted Catholic Ventru against their Orthodox and Muslim clanmates. Just as the clan had forgotten the organization and regulation imposed by Camilla, so too had they forgotten the idea of clan unity and the organizational benefits that came with it. And then came the double whammy of the Shadow Inquisition and the Anarch Revolt. After Hardestant the Elder was somehow diablerized by the Bruja neonate Tyler, it would be his childer, Hardestant the Younger, that would remind the clan that they were stronger together. While he is mostly famous as one of the co-founders of the Camarilla and de facto leader of Clan Ventru during the early days of the sect, Hardestat is also noteworthy for reimposing the system that Camilla had created during the Roman Empire. Once again, Clan Ventru was persuaded to unite and organize, re-establishing the hierarchy that they have maintained ever since, well into the modern knights. Given that there are many similarities between the organization of Clan Ventru and the Camarilla, Hardestat's influence on the creation of the sect is unmistakable, and one of several reasons why the Camarilla, though comprised of multiple clans, has often been seen by many, especially the Bruja, as a Ventru project. Yet another reason why the Bruja don't particularly like the Ventru. After the Anarch Revolt concluded with the Convention of Thorns in 1493, the vast majority of those Ventru that had sided with the Anarchs resubordinated themselves to the clan elders and the Camarilla leadership. But a small minority remained with the Sabbat, becoming the Ventru anti-tribu, rejecting the authority of the elders and seeking their overthrow. The ideological divide between the two branches of the clan became a cultural one as Europe transitioned into the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. Seeing the success of such clan members as Robert Cross and Juan Miguel Ramirez, many Ventru elders began seeing new avenues to power in the emerging mercantile and business interests that arose during the Renaissance and the Reformation. Whether it was in the development of banking among the Italian city-states, the unheard of riches of the Spanish colonial empire, or the wealth accrued by the savvy businessmen of the Netherlands, and so, as the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries rolled by, those Ventru aligned with the Camarilla more and more began to seek embraces and establish connections not to the knights and warrior aristocrats of old, but rather among these new men of wealth, 
from merchant cabals to banking families, and even the first modern business magnates as the Industrial Revolution began to kick in. They also managed to worm their ways into the first multinational corporations like the Dutch and British East India companies. For the Camarilla Ventru, this was merely a new way of maintaining their dominance and power. But to the Ventru Anti-Tribu, this new emphasis on economy and commerce was a betrayal of the clan's warrior heritage. From Sparta to Rome to the Dark Ages, Clan Ventru had won its preeminence with steel, not gold. Power, authority, and dignitas were won with swords, not coin. Thus, in the modern nights, where the stereotypical Camarilla Ventru is a kind of undead businessman, the Ventru Antitribu behave and see themselves as undead paladins for the Sabbat. Preserving a dark, twisted reflection of the knightly warrior code of the Dark Ages. In their eyes, those Ventru aligned with the Camarilla have not only failed their ancient heritage, but betrayed it. Few Sabbat vampires hate their Camarilla counterparts as fervently as the Ventru Antitribu. It's also why the Ventru Antitribu have a different discipline spread from that of the main clan. Where the primary abilities of Camarilla Ventru are Fortitude, Supernatural Resilience, Presence, Superhuman Charisma, and Dominate, Vampiric Mind Control, the Antitribu substitute Auspex, Supernatural Senses, for Presence, making them somewhat more combat-oriented than the socially inclined Camarilla Ventru. However, the Antitribu became the least of Clan Ventru's problems as the centuries continued to roll by and as Europe entered the Age of Enlightenment and Revolution. Few Ventru that unlived through it look back on the Enlightenment or the revolutions that resulted from it with any fondness. The American Revolution, 1776. The French Revolution, 1789. The Haitian Revolution, 1791 the Spanish-American Revolutions, 1808, the July Revolution, 1830, and don't even mention the year 1848 around some elders. Vampires, regardless of sect or clan, are dependent to some degree on human society. And for the Ventru, a clan that prizes wealth, power, and status above all else, socio-political stability is necessary to ensure that those things flourish. And the thing about revolutions is that they are inherently destabilizing, regardless of whether you agree with their politics or not. A successful revolution inevitably means the overthrow of an old system by a new one. It's no longer just, the king is dead, long live the king. You're literally replacing an entire system of government with a new one. And that's generally bad news if you're the kind of person who profits from the status quo. Back when the Age of Discovery began at the tail end of the 15th century, it had been the Sabbat that had been first across the Atlantic to infest the new human colonies of the Americas. Despite their best efforts to keep their rivals out, the Camarilla, including the Ventru, made some inroads, particularly into the 13 colonies set up by the British. And then the American Revolution happened, and a lot of that work was undone. The Ventru suffered especially as it had been younger members of the clan seeking new opportunities that had crossed to the New World, and these were in turn picked off by their Sabbat enemies. Luckily for the Ventru and the Camarilla as a whole, the Sabbat had its first civil war a few decades later, giving the rival sect the opening it needed to regain the lost ground. And so, while the United States remains highly contested ground between the two sects well into the modern nights, the Camarilla, with the Ventru at the forefront, was able to establish a secure foothold in the Americas. After 1848, things seemed to calm down in the Western world, and the vampires all went back to doing what they'd always done, observing humanity from the shadows, feeding off of them in terms of both blood and treasure, and manipulating human politics as it suited the interests of the undead. One great example would be the American Civil War, Seeing as they view all humanity as chattel to be fed upon at will, the Ventru really didn't care one way or another for the issue of slavery or states' rights. But since there were a lot of Sabbat strongholds in what was then the Confederate States of America, 
Packs and coteries of Ventru vampires were more than happy to follow the Union army in its incursions into the South, most famously during William Tecumseh Sherman's march through Georgia. As the Army of Tennessee and the Army of Georgia slashed and burnt their way through the South, the Ventru shadowed them, destroying many Sabat vampires caught up in the chaos, capturing Atlanta and Savannah, allowing the Camarilla to extend its influence further into the South. However, the Ventru saw their greatest success in the latter half of the 19th century in Europe. After 1848, it seemed that the fire of revolution had finally been snuffed out. Any rebellions that sprang up afterwards were swiftly put down by the authorities. With all that done, and with no influence left in the New World apart from a few islands in the Caribbean and Canada, the great powers of Europe, strengthened by the technology of the Industrial Revolution, turned their eyes to the rest of the Old World. Thus, a new era of imperialism and colonialism began, and with it, the Victorian Age, which many Ventru argue was a second golden age for the clan, equaling that of the glory days of Rome. Naturally, the Ventru had their undead fingers in every imperial pie, whether it was big boys like Russia or France, small but relatively spunky powers like Belgium and the Netherlands, and even those empires who had had a good start but whose glory days had waned, like Portugal, Denmark, and Spain. The Ventru were also heavily involved in the unification of Germany and its subsequent imperialism. Although, in true Camarilla fashion, they mostly did this by letting Otto von Bismarck do all the work and only intervening when some backward-thinking kindred or sabat assassin tried to kill the minister-president. But of course, if we're talking the Victorian age, we must address the big mama of them all, the British Empire. For all vampires, the Victorian world was divided into two parts. The lands of barbarism, where the Sabbat reigned supreme and still gloried in terrorizing superstitious mortals, and the lands of civilization, where the Camarilla reigned supreme. And with the British Empire at its height, the city of London, its capital, became the beating heart of the Camarilla. In fact, in those days, the Camarilla were so wedded to the British Empire that the sect itself was referred to as simply the Empire. And Clan Ventru was at the heart of it all managing internal affairs, and otherwise stewarding that which Hardestat the Younger had helped to create. New technology and new ideas allowed for new opportunities for even young members of the clan, although of course many elders lamented the waning of the old feudal values, sneering at the increasingly loud voice of the mob as the old aristocracy waned and new industrial and business elites took their place. But for most members of the clan, the transition was not too difficult. The Ventru had always believed that those who lead should be held to high standards of ability and of personal conduct. Of course, the Ventru naturally think that they are innately better at meeting these higher standards than the other clans, but we already know about that. And so, the virtue of noblesse oblige, cultivated during the Dark Ages, transitioned rather smoothly into the behavioral proprieties of being a good Victorian gentleman, or gentlewoman. Depending on what source book you're using, either Mithras still reigned supreme in London around this time, or power has passed to his former seneschal, Anne Bosley, who would later style herself Queen Anne. But even if London remained the nerve center for both mortal and vampiric activities at the time, the fact that Britain controlled a quarter of the world meant that there were plenty of opportunities for younger kindred in the colonies, the wealthiest of these being India. And it is here that we must talk about the one and only bloodline to be produced by Clan Ventru apart from the anti-tribu, the Danava, a bloodline descending from Vedarta, one of the childer, supposedly, of the Ventru Antediluvian. Although some sources, particularly in the early editions, suggest that Fedarta was himself the Ventru Antediluvian. Certainly, the Danava believe this, claiming descent from him and thinking themselves the true Ventru, and that the main clan are a bunch of imposters. Vampires descended from the Ventru Antediluvian have been in India since the dawn of human history. One noteworthy example being the great Bindusara, who was a contemporary of the mortal ruler Chandragupta Maurya, founder of India's first great empire, and in fact even still exists in the modern nights, residing in Alexandria. 
Just as the venture of Christendom and the Islamic world were influenced by local customs and beliefs, the Danava fully embraced Hinduism, arranging themselves along with the other vampires into a mirror image of the Hindu caste system. Naturally, the Danava identify with the very top of Hindu society, the Brahmin priest caste, and in fact will only embrace humans from that caste. For many centuries, the Danava were mostly defined by a conflict within their own ranks over the exact origin of their bloodline. One school of thought argued that their sire, Vedarta, was descended from the goddess Danu, an ancient primordial figure in Hinduism. Another school of thought insists that the Danava are Ashuras, demons made flesh, while still others insist that they were Devas, manifestations of the will of the Hindu gods upon the earth. This dispute over origins became so fierce that during the 13th century, those who adhered to the Ashura origin made it a habit of hunting down and assassinating those who adhered to the Deva origin story. When not arguing with and even murdering each other over what their origin was, the Danava lived and behaved much like the undead counterparts of Brahmin priests. They observed rites, made sacrifice to the Hindu gods, studied the ancient texts, engaged in divination, and practiced a unique form of blood magic known as sadhana, which they believe will help them one day transcend their undead existence, essentially a vampiric equivalent of achieving nirvana and escaping the cycle of reincarnation. The Danava, along with most of the Hindu vampires of India, lost a great deal of their power in the subcontinent in the year 1001, when the first Muslim invasions of India began, bringing with them many Ashira, or Muslim vampires. Then a few centuries later came the first Mongol invasions of India, and with them another breed of undead from the Far East, the Kuei Jin. Eventually, the three factions of undead in the subcontinent settled into an uneasy coexistence, although the Ashira maintained a dominant position. That all changed in 1829 when Clan Tremere arrived and established its first chantry in India. Sensing an opportunity, the Hindu vampires, including the Danava, as well as many younger Ashira, joined with the newcomers from Europe to destroy the power base of the Ashira elders, launching their campaign during the backdrop of the Great Indian Mutiny of 1857. The end result was an uneasy four-way stalemate, with the natives Camarilla, Ashira, and Kuei Jin jockeying for influence in the subcontinent. The thing is, the Ventru are not particularly fond of this bloodline of the Danava, mostly because they don't like the idea of bloodlines in general. They view them as corruptions of the pure lineage of the Antediluvians. So for a long time, they tried to ignore the connection between themselves and the Danava. But when the Danava began proclaiming that they were the true heirs of the Ventru Antediluvian and that the Ventru themselves were the imposters, it kind of erased any doubt that they were in fact a Ventru bloodline because who else would be that arrogant? This minor embarrassment aside, the Ventru for the most part enjoyed the Victorian age, and while they knew all mortal things must come to an end, they were not expecting this second golden age to end so soon or so abruptly. But then the world wars happened and everything changed. If there's one thing that mortals and supernaturals of all kinds in the world of darkness can agree on, it's this. World War I was a cataclysm. It not only destroyed thousands of lives, not only did it scar the very world with the marks of its violence, but it also marked the death of old ways, old ideas, old certainties, old beliefs. The Ventru were smart enough to keep their heads down and avoid the trenches, but many business interests that they depended on suffered greatly as a result of the devastation of the First World War, and took an even bigger hit in the purely economic sense when the Great Depression set in. Europe, the heartland of not just Clan Ventru, but the Camarilla as a whole, was devastated. A broken, shattered landscape struggling to recover. Is it any wonder, then, that when men like Mussolini and Hitler came along, 
Some in the clan saw new opportunities and the hope of a new beginning. While many Ventru washed their hands of the old world and crossed the Atlantic to America, many young Ventru that remained behind became enamored of these new dictators and their promises and their ideas. In such mortal leaders, they saw another rise to greatness, a rebirth from the ashes. By contrast, the elders held such men in disdain. It's not that they had qualms about Nazism and fascism, such human ideologies held no weight with them. Rather, it was the fact that these two men struck them as demagogues, men who built their power base by appealing to the rabble. It was a kind of populism that was guaranteed to rub elitists like themselves the wrong way. What's more, many saw these dictators as a threat. Not so much the fascists, like so many movements before and after them, it was easy for the Ventru to infiltrate them. But the Nazis were different, because unlike the fascists, who were purely materialistic, there were many within the new government of the Third Reich who believed in and possessed great knowledge of what was deemed the occult. What's worse, Hitler's paranoia of supernatural attempts to influence him made it damn near impossible for any vampire to get near him, let alone try to influence him. Humans with enough supernatural knowledge that they could not be so easily manipulated by the old tactics. That was definitely going to give the Ventru pause. What's more, the Nazis were massacring Jews because they believed them to be part of a shadowy cabal subverting humanity from the shadows. If the Nazis ever discovered that there actually was a shadowy cabal secretly manipulating humanity, why shouldn't that murderous intent be turned against the undead? It would be the Shadow Inquisition all over again. Worse even, given that the Nazis had greater occult knowledge and more high-tech toys than the Inquisitors of old. Luckily, it never came to that. The Axis powers were crushed, and soon enough the post-war world settled into its famous two-way struggle between capitalism and communism, NATO versus the East Bloc. One of the perks of undeath is long memory, and there were many Ventru that remembered how the Crusades pitted members of the clan against one another along religious lines. No such mistake would be made in the 20th. On both sides of the Iron Curtain, Ventru entrenched themselves into government and industrial concerns, and cooperated with one another throughout the Cold War. Let the kind fight their stupid ideological war. Let the Clan of Kings profit from their conflict as they have always done. While it was not quite the glory days of the Victorian age, Clan Ventru did reasonably well during the late 20th century. But of course, this was not without its problems and its dangers. There was the creation of the Anarch Free State in the middle of the 20th century, and while that soon fell apart, as many in the Camarilla had expected it would, the sudden inroads of the Cathayan vampires, or Kuei Jin as they are sometimes called, has raised significant concerns. Meanwhile, while many Ventru in the West, particularly in America, did quite well for themselves during the Cold War, Many East Bloc Ventru found themselves in fierce competition with other clans, particularly the Bruja in Russia. And of course, when the Soviet Union finally collapsed, most East Bloc Ventru were stripped of a good deal of their power as the governments that they'd attached themselves to fell apart. Though some have compensated for this by infiltrating the Russian mob. However, throughout the Cold War, the biggest fear Clan Ventru and the Camarilla as a whole had to worry about was the nuclear bomb. Hiroshima and Nagasaki awakened the vampires to the terrible reality that humans now possessed weapons that could wipe whole cities off the map. Simply going underground or laying low wouldn't save any kindred if someone decided to drop an atomic bomb on their heads. Some during the 60s proposed the idea that the Ventru should acquire atomic weapons for themselves. But the idea was quickly dropped, mostly on the grounds that the Ventru don't trust anyone, including their own, with such terrible weapons. And so, throughout the Cold War, they adopted a policy of making sure that only mortal governments controlled atomic weaponry. Naturally, their biggest nightmare scenario was the idea of the Sabbat getting their hands on a nuke. Given how inhuman and chaotic they often tend to be, there was no doubt that if the Sabbat ever got a nuke, they would use it. If anything, the end of the Cold War even heightened these fears, as with the fall of the Soviet Union, a lot of nukes began disappearing from official government storehouses, 
thanks to black market arms dealers. Clan Ventru was swift to act against these, hunting down any mortal who was willing to sell rogue nukes to states like Iran or North Korea, eliminating them, and then of course taking over their businesses for themselves. And so at last, we have arrived at Clan Ventru in the Modern Knights, a clan that above all values power and a twisted mirror image of nobility. A clan with exacting standards over who they think is worthy to be embraced. Not just businessmen, although that is their stereotype, but also people in government, organized crime, the military, the clergy, and even some unlikely sources, labor unions and academia. After all, labor unions may seem a bit too proletarian for the Blue Bloods, but they are, after all, a political institution and political institution means power. As for academia, even the most stuck-up elder knows that sometimes you need fresh blood and fresh ideas to keep a good clan going. And academicians, who are good at research and working within a social structure, can make for good assets. And given recent developments at the turn of the millennium, the Ventru are going to need all of the help they can get, both to ensure clan Ventru's strength and dominance as well as their ability to guide the rest of their wayward kindred onto what they think is the best path. The defection of Clan Gangrel in 1999 was bad enough, but then the Conclave of Prague happened in 2012, and the Bruja not only left the sect, but they killed several prominent Ventru leaders, including Hardestat the Younger, on their way out. The Camarilla has managed to bounce back with the additions of Clan La Sombra and Banu Hakim, the former being especially satisfying since their gain is the Sabbat's loss. But the decline of their old enemy is cold comfort, as the Anarch movement, now reinvigorated, seems to have stepped into its place as the principal opposition to the Camarilla. The system that Hardestat the Younger helped build at the tail end of the 15th century has been threatened in ways that it never has been before. And while the Ventru have had to share power within the sect with those other member clans, in many ways they see the Camarilla as their baby, their project. And by hook or by crook, by fair means or foul, mostly foul, Clan Ventru is determined to keep it going. The Gehenna Wars may have started, but they are still the Clan of Kings, the Blue Bloods. As far as they're concerned, the cream of the undead crop. They have ruled over large swaths of the world by night for thousands of years. And from the lowliest neonate to the most grand Methuselah, they intend to keep on ruling for thousands of years to come.